I'm so excited to introduce our next doctor, Dr. Stuart Friedenfeld. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Well, I'd like to talk a little bit before we get started, um, just a little bit about your background and, and what your practice used to be. So, used to be, indeed, I retired two and a half years ago. Um, I had a very comprehensive integrative medicine practice, covered everything from autism, cancer, cardiovascular, autoimmune, um, mostly in, involved with the effects of environmental uh, toxins and um, you know how they how they impact all of the diseases of our modern day. And so, when you look at autism and the, the environmental toxins, they really go hand in hand. Absolutely. And so, can we maybe explain a little bit for those that are watching? Obviously, you and I. We've been around for a while. We know what environmental toxins are. Some of us longer than others. <laughs> and environmental toxins, I still can't believe there's so many that don't really understand what that means. Well, maybe terminology first. Um, a toxin is a biologic product, something that produced by mushrooms and snakes in our own body, uh, as opposed to toxicants that are uh, chemicals derived from man-made activities, typically. Uh, and heavy metals are are toxins, uh, but not really toxins, but they're, they're toxic metals. But the, the toxicants are the substances that we produced for our pesticides, our preservatives, our uh, flame retardants, plasticizers, etc. And so how does environmental toxins, how does that have, relate to anything to do with autism? Well, we know that there is a genetic predisposition to a whole host of diseases, whether it's cancer, cardiovascular disease, uh, arthritis, um, and indeed the neurodegenerative diseases, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and autism. But that is not a, a, a finished product. These, these genetic variants are not mutations that occurred uh, out of the blue. These are, are, are potential uh, options in our body. When the environment changes, People who have the genetic wherewithal to thrive in that new environment are going to have more living children, and, and the population develops uh, more of these qualities. A, uh, a, a longer-necked giraffe is going to have a better ability to propagate when the, the short vegetation disappears, the environment changes. So we don't develop a new genetic variant as a result of the uh, environment, but we have it on hand. It's our potential. The, the genes that make us more susceptible to brain damage uh, and the other damages associated with autism um, are triggered by environmental toxins. So people who are better able to deal with the environmental toxicants are going to do better. Autism, cancer, uh, cardiovascular disease, neurodegenerative diseases, all of those diseases are going to be more susceptible as the environment becomes uh, more toxic, and some of us are going to do better. Now, in other species, you don't do well, you don't make it, you get eaten. Uh, humans, we tend to take care of Aunt Betty uh, and, and our, our, our children, even though they may not be as environmentally proficient. Um, so the, the kids getting autism are really showing us the severity of our environmental change. And is there something that we can do in our own households, in our own lives, to make the environmental toxins less than? Oh, that, I'm so glad you asked that question. Because that really is the key. And, and so much, you know, growing up, we talked about the, the smokestacks and the polluted rivers. And that is absolutely a factor and something that we need to deal with on a government level and on a societal level. But on a personal level, we develop, we, we go out and shop and bring home substances to eat, to wear, to clean our house with. And if we become knowledgeable and, um, uh, and proficient at identifying what are, what's safe and what's not safe, then we can make those choices. And it doesn't even have to be 100%. But if we can start saying that we don't need plastics in our life, we don't need to wrap our food 
um, with, with styrofoam and those gushy pads that uh, produce the same substance as, um, as Teflon in our bodies, um, you know, wrapped in saran wrap or put in tin cans with bisphenol A uh, lining the can. Um, if, we, if we buy food that hasn't been poisoned by pesticides and herbicides and uh, rodenticides, if we buy clothes that doesn't have flame retardants in it. These are just simple things that we can learn about. It may cost us more dollars, but we save a whole lot in our health, our family health. Absolutely. And in the long run, we're gonna save money because healthcare is expensive. And it's things that we can do, it's things we have control over in our own lives. So Absolutely. it's just all you're doing is swapping out this for this and it's not it, to me, it's like an apple for an apple, but this apple's a lot healthier. <laughs> <laughs> Given the choice, if yeah. you went to the market, and if the, the labels on the market shelf was organic, meaning that it had no pesticides, herbicides, it, it wasn't uh, uh, new, uh, nourished with, with sewer sludge, that's what they put with your fertilizer. I said, this is organic, and this is, well, what's the stuff that is not organic? It's the stuff that was poisoned. So it's organic poison. Which would you choose? Exactly. The poison is cheaper. It's a lot cheaper. But they make it sound poison. And they make it sound so pretty. They say conventional instead of poison. That that, I mean, it would be nice if they had those two words. I think organic prices and the the sales would go through the roof. You know, at that point. Who knows? What you say? Here's here's a bucket of pesticide. You make a soup out of it. Why not? And nobody would nobody would ever eat that. No, no. I mean, if they said to you, you want to put Put mercury in your teeth. No, they say you put know, silver fillings in. Yeah. So who's going to put in this this poison? Yeah, it's the way they word it. Yeah. And so for the families out there with children with autism or individuals of any age, I should say, um, how is that affecting their autism? How is that affecting if you're in an environment filled with toxins? Are we seeing the behaviors change? Are we seeing the behaviors increase? Or well, get it, better? It, it's, it's difficult to do that correlation and. and you know, one really good study um, looked at the correlation of the rise in autism and various toxicants, mercury, lead. You know, mercury is, is, is decreasing the exposure. Lead is decreasing the exposure. Aluminum is not. Um, pesticides. And the only two things that really correlated with the rise in autism and the the quantity of these substances that were exposed to in our environment was aluminum and glyphosate. Just and explain to people what glyphosate is. Glyphosate is, is the, the, the substance in uh, Roundup uh, that is a, <laughs> it has so many effects. Uh, it, it is a, a weed killer, um, but it, it has an effect on the bacteria in the environment, in our, our microbiome, it affects our mitochondrial function. And so many of these toxicants, really, if we look at all of the parameters that are disrupted in autistic kids, whether it's mitochondrial disruption, oxidative stress disruption, um, and on and on, the toxicants, one after another, that we're bringing home on our, in our shopping bags, are causing all of those entities, every single one of them. And it's so scary to think about, though. We live, you know, whether you live in America or you live in Europe or wherever you might live, it, it, you can't get away from toxins. That's the problem. It's in our air that we breathe. It's in the water we drink. It's everywhere we go. What can we do, one, when you before you even get pregnant, right? Is there anything you can do? Two, you already had the baby. What can you do? And then three, if you do end up having a child with autism, well, now you're there. What can we do right now today? So many years ago, um, we were in, in uh, autism uh, think tanks. We we're talking about this 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 epidemic, this rising numbers of autistic children, um, and all of the treatments that we could do. You know, that that's pretty downstream. We can give them methyl B12 and hyperbarics and and detoxify them. But if we don't do something to stop the process, then we're going to be treating a greater and greater horde. Right? So, so we need to go back and say, what, 
what is causing this and what can we do before you have your next baby? Mm -hmm. And so they said, go ahead, buy the talk. Yeah, what can we do? <laughs> so so that, that's where this started. And, and having, having done that, it was a process that just, it, 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 it took me many hours longer than it should have because as I was reading about phthalates and bisphenol A and pesticides, it was so gut-wrenching. I actually had to stop and go out for a, a walk in, in the woods and, and go clear my brain and calm down and come back and do the work. I thought that, that for a generation, we have been poisoning our population, our children. I've been doing it. Um, so it became clear that, that the same process that we need to do for before we have our next baby is what we need to do for ourselves, for our parents and our grandparents, our aunts and uncles. It really is just taking a stand and saying, no, I don't need to buy things in plastic. I don't need to cook in plastic. I don't need to poison the oceans with plastic. I don't need to buy fruits and vegetables that were sprayed with pesticides. Mm -hmm. I don't need to eat as much meat as I have been. And when I do, I'm going to choose an animal that was allowed to live free range and eat its natural food and not be force fed corn with, with antibiotics and, and all kinds of garbage in it. And we could make those choices. They're very simple choices, really. They're simple choices. If you think about the majority of pesticides used in the world is on cotton fields. Well, the farmers that, that are sent, the peasants that are sent out to those cotton fields late with pesticides are being poisoned. So when we buy a cotton shirt that's not organically grown, we're supporting an industry that poisons a large part of the world. Besides spraying these pesticides and getting into our waterways and our air. So it's a little things we have to do to just think about the next steps for the next generations. Right. And again, you don't have to do everything. Mm -hmm. But the more you can do, and as you enter this process, little by little, just cleaning it up piece by piece. I know in our home, you know, using non-toxic cleaners, you know, um, you think about why did you even pick the cleaner you did to begin with? And for me, I remember being in college, and I go to the store and I buy the cleaner that my family bought. And so if each family decides to change that one thing, just that one thing of buying a non-toxic cleaner, then when the next generation goes to college and buys the cleaners, they'll automatically just buy the non-toxic cleaners. So just think about it. If you've yeah. got a cleaner, does it make sense to use a cleaner that is a toxicant? What are we trying to do when we clean things? You, you want to make it shiny or you want to make it healthy? That's a good point. It's absolutely a good point. Um, so I think those are little things we can do. At, we, at our home, we. We have a water filtration system, an air filtration system. You know, we don't allow any pesticides, even you know, with our grass. Or we do get more weeds. I will be honest. We use the organic oils we can, and you know what? Life is what it is. We may not have the most perfect grass because we get some weeds in there, but I know we are doing everything we can to be as healthy as we can and to keep our environment around us and our bubble as clean as we can. Great point. You know, when when when. When you're out spreading something on your lawn and your neighbor looks at you, tell them, it's okay. This is non-toxic. Your children can come and play on my lawn. Exactly. The squirrels can come and, and eat the nuts on my lawn. Yeah. The chipmunks and rabbits and the birds. Well, anything it says when a dog can't go on the grass, you know? <laughs> but I, don't, I never think to myself, but let's put our baby on the grass a day right. later. I mean. <laughs> or the dog comes inside. Yeah, exactly. And the baby loves the dog. Yeah, so things like that, sometimes you wonder like, I, and I'm guilty of it, not having common sense back in the day of like, We're why did guilty. I do that? We're all guilty. Yeah. We just need to moderate. And as we go through this, we'll moderate more and more. Absolutely. Now, what advice for those families out there? There's a lot of new families. As you know, you used the word epidemic. And these families that are getting this diagnosis for the first time, a lot of them just don't even know where to turn. They got this word autism. It's a brand new word to them. What advice can you give them right now? That's a short answer, <laughs> a short question with a very long answer. Uh, there is so much, and, and on their own, the, the dietary interventions are really important, but unfortunately, we often talk about 
what you should take out of your diet without as much emphasis on what the diet should contain. Um, you know, having gluten-free and casein-free Dunkin' Donuts, Dunkin' Donuts makes it <laughs> gluten-free, casein-free, but you know, the, the, that we want to eat food that we evolved eating. Um, we are still present in this world because we were able to live with what the planet provided. Members of our species and other uh, homo species that uh, it didn't do so well have disappeared. Right? We're here because we, are, we have what we need to stay healthy, to make ourselves healthy. We want to eat the food that grows. You want to eat food that looks like something grew somewhere. You recognize it. Right? You recognize broccoli. I don't recognize cornflakes. Good point. Absolutely. So eat the foods that nourish our bodies. That's basically it. something that makes sense that looks like the actual food. Yeah. So we want to, we want to replace gluten and casein. Most of the kids have a dramatic improvement with that. So changing the diet. There's many diets, and I think that the diets are somewhat because of the food that we're eating specifically, but I'm, I'm becoming more and more of the mind that the foods are supporting or altering our microbiome. So if we're eating foods that is different than from the, the uh, diet that we evolved over two and a half million years for, for uh, hominids, then we are going to support bacteria in our gut that are not the ones that nourish us best. If you've got a thousand species of bugs living in your gut, well, they are going to, they're going to try to keep themselves alive like every other living organism, tries to maintain life. If you feed it um, sugar and, and dairy and wheat products that had nothing to do with our evolutionary past, then bugs in there that are less adaptable, less beneficial to us, are going to thrive at the expense of other ones. If we eat a diet that has uh, more diversity, better quality, better nourishment, then we're going to support bugs that are healthier for us. And what the microbiome does for us is incredible. We are, we are just beginning the process of learning about this, this, this vital organ, this organ that we developed after birth. And to think that you would, you would eat something that would damage your kidney, or 20% you know, loss of liver function, would you ever do that? Would you ever give that to your child? And yet, when we are, especially in the first nine months, when we're feeding a, a child something other than mother's milk, we are supporting unhealthy bacteria. We're growing bugs in this bug in, in the gut that will be there for the rest of our lives. You know, the evidence is really that you develop your microbiome in the first six to nine months. After that, you support or diminish members of that of that uh, microbiome. So, the first foods are very important, and afterwards, giving them good, healthy nourishment because they affect all of our organs. They interact with our immune system, with our brain, uh, with our GI tract, and on and on. Well, I love that message, basically. Guys, when you're going to the market, remember we're trying to feed our body the good stuff. And uh, thank you so much for providing hope and uh, just giving us a great resource. Thank you. Thank you.